Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Bitter Pill. So today what I want to do is a bit of a change for, of pace for me and then I'm going to try to make a short video. And basically, as you can see from the title there, the purpose of this video is to give a speech as if I were speaking at an anti-war rally that kind of summarizes in a nutshell some of the most basic things I would like for people to know. Okay, so here we go. I hear a lot of talk among anti-war folks to the effect that I'm against the U.S.'s proxy war in Ukraine. We shouldn't be sending tens of billions of dollars worth of weapons there so that they can fight Russia, quote, to the last Ukrainian. But this war is reactionary on both sides. Or... We have to be against both U.S. imperialism and Russian imperialism. Russia shouldn't have invaded Ukraine. Or even, you're pro-war, quote-unquote, if you don't unreservedly oppose Russia's invasion and call for its unconditional withdrawal from Ukraine. Now let me start by saying that no sane person, including the Ukraine war opponents that some on the left are condemning as pro-war, is actually pro-war. Roughly 200,000 Ukrainian troops, 20,000 Russian or allied soldiers, and 10,000 civilians have been killed during this war. Many more have been seriously injured, and there's been a vast amount of property destruction and worldwide economic fallout. Also, given that it's in reality a war between two nuclear powers, since Ukraine is a proxy whose war effort is heavily funded by the U.S., it's an extremely dangerous situation. So, you know, if I could wave a magic wand and end this war tomorrow while protecting the future security of all parties involved, I would do so immediately. But achieving peace in Ukraine requires understanding what led up to the current war between Russia and Ukraine slash NATO, what has kept it going for over a year now, and the overall geopolitical context. And that requires investing a lot of time and effort. To be honest, I see few people, even among those who consider themselves anti-war, who are willing to do that. <clears throat> now, the central fact that I hope to get people to understand about why Russia entered the Ukraine conflict, which began in 2014, not 2022, is that Russia, correctly in my opinion, perceived Ukraine's escalation of its attack on the eastern Ukrainian Donbass region in the weeks prior to Russia launching its military operation as an existential threat to ethnic Russians living in eastern Ukraine, and along with a variety of other uh, things that have happened over the past few years, an existential threat to Russia itself. <clears throat> now, the elephant in the living room in this conflict you know, the big stinky elephant that's been shitting all over other countries for centuries now is the United States. Until recently, it's been the undisputed global hegemon, dominating the world politically, economically, and militarily for several decades. Through its hundreds of foreign military interventions, control of international lending institutions like the IMF and World Bank, use of economic sanctions as a tool of war, and the ongoing efforts of U.S. intelligence services, as well as NGOs backed by the National Endowment for Democracy to subvert governments all over the world. The U.S. has interfered in dozens of elections, including in Russia itself, as well as its neighbors, Ukraine and Georgia. It's backed anti-government protests and terrorist groups in dozens more countries, resulting in the overthrow of numerous governments, including Ukraine's, in 2004 and 2014. And even the U.S.'s supposed allies are not protected from its bullying, as demonstrated by its sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline, which didn't just hurt Russia, but is also wreaking economic havoc on Western Ukraine. I mean, excuse me, Western Europe. And although it's bullied countries all over the world, the U.S. has a Captain Ahab-like obsession with subverting and attempting to overthrow the Russian government and when it existed, uh, the government of the Soviet Union. Within months of the Russian Revolution, the U.S. and several imperialist nations invaded Russia, joining the white Russians' efforts to overthrow the Bolshevik government. 
Now, of course, during World War II, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, causing the deaths of roughly 27 million people, and that's an event that's a very strong historical memory for the Russian people. After the war, the U.S. funded and armed Ukraine's version of the Nazis, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, led by Stefan Bandera, fresh off participating in some of the largest massacres of the Holocaust. And the goal was to subvert the Soviet Union, of which Ukraine was part at the time. And they killed tens of thousands of their countrymen between 1945 and 1953, when the OUN's terrorism was finally put down by the Soviet Union. And then between a combination of funding the Islamic fundamentalist Mujahideen in Afghanistan and massive funding of right-wing anti-communist political organizations in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe uh, through the NED, founded by Ronald Reagan, the U.S. helped bring about the downfall of the Soviet Union. Although downfall isn't really the right term here. It was basically a coup engineered by U.S. puppet Boris Yeltsin and his cronies and contrary to the wishes of the Soviet people. <coughs> and the free fall into Wild West neoliberal capitalism that ensued, where Russian assets were open for plunder by foreign and domestic oligarchs, caused Russia's GDP and industrial production to fall by nearly half, resulting in skyrocketing poverty and a nearly four-year reduction in life expectancy during the first half of the 1990s. And then, just for good measure, to make sure Russia remained under the U.S.'s thumb, the U.S. rigged Yeltsin's re-election in 1996, which is quite the irony given the debunked Russiagate narrative that claimed Russia rigged the 2016 U.S. presidential election. <coughs> Despite a pledge by U.S. Secretary of State James Baker to Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev after German reunification that NATO would not expand one inch eastward, it has indeed expanded eastward, doubling its membership from 14 countries to 28. And with the U.S. no longer constrained in what weapons it could deploy, given its withdrawal from the anti-ballistic missile and intermediate range nuclear forces treaties, missiles capable of carrying nuclear warheads have been located in countries bordering Russia. And particularly problematic for Russia was the threat of expansion to Georgia and Ukraine, both of which have often had governments hostile to Russia in recent years, and both of which have long borders with Russia. So that, that's kind of a red line for Russia. And just in case you have any doubts about the U.S.'s intentions with respect to Russia, uh, many, many U.S. politicians uh, have acknowledged that the U.S.'s objective is to weaken, if not overthrow, the Russian government. Now, it may come as a shock to you that the U.S. has also attempted to destabilize and subordinate neighboring Ukraine. Viktor Yushchenko, uh, a longtime tool of the IMF who became head of the National Bank of Ukraine in the early 90s, presided over implementation of the same sort of neoliberal shock therapy that was undertaken in Russia at that time with similar results. The difference was there was never any turnaround in the Ukrainian economy, and Ukraine ultimately became the poorest country in Europe. In 2004, Yushchenko, the banker, ran for president and was defeated by Viktor Yanukovych. But because Yanukovych was not a U.S. puppet like Yushchenko, Western governments refused to recognize the outcome and declared electoral fraud. And so, um, you know, as you might expect, there were many, many NED-funded organizations and media outlets in Ukraine uh, that organized massive protests that uh, occurred uh, in protest to the uh, election outcome. And the result was Ukraine's Supreme Court annulled the results and called a second election, which was won by Yushchenko. But Yushchenko's program of austerity and his efforts to suppress the language rights of the Russian minority made him extremely unpopular. So in the 2010 election, he lost badly to Yanukovych, only receiving 5% of the vote. <clears throat> Now, you probably know what happened next. In 2013, as a result of Yanukovych rejecting an IMF loan plan that would have called for further neoliberalization of the economy, 
and instead accepting a package of uh, with more favorable terms from Russia, uh, mass protests ensued. Um, you know, again, heavily backed by the U.S. Um, and largely led by far-right elements such as Svoboda, Nazi Party, C-14, its Youth Brigade, and Right Sector, a coalition of fascist organizations. Um, and pretty soon the protests turned violent and Yanukovych's government was overthrown in February of 2014. Now the protests and the coup government had some popular support in the western part of the country, but given the anti-Russian bent of uh, the coup leaders, who were of course ideological descendants and admirers of Stepan Bandera and his gang of genocidal thugs, it's not surprising that people in the overwhelmingly Russian-speaking eastern part of the country weren't big fans. So there were major protests against the coup government in cities in that part of the country, like Odessa, Donetsk, and Sevastopol. Shortly after that, residents of Crimea organized a referendum to leave Ukraine and join Russia. 96% of voters voted for Crimea to rejoin Russia. Uh, and polls and uh, interviews have uh, confirmed that you, you know, Crimeans have continued to be happy with that decision. But you might wonder you know, how they got to that point, uh, you know, even though there were, um, you know, even though the, the coup was not popular, you know, why would Crimea alone uh, vote to secede? Um, to fully understand why Crimeans were so eager to separate from Ukraine and to join Russia, we need to look at uh, Crimea's history. Uh, so historically, it had always been part of Russia up until 1954, when Soviet Premier Khrushchev, who was Ukrainian, quote-unquote gave Crimea, um, which at that time was part of Russia as well as the Soviet Union, to Ukraine, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. <clears throat> and the overwhelmingly ethnically Russian residents there weren't necessarily happy with that decision. So shortly before the 1991 breakup of the Soviet Union, which perhaps they saw coming, 94% of Crimeans voted for independence from Ukraine and the formation of what they call the Crimean Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic. Then in 1994, when in, uh, Ukraine was an independent country, 73% voted for presidential candidate, uh, uh, president of Crimea, that is, Yuri Meshkov, who advocated Crimea leaving Ukraine and joining Russia and 78% voted for a referendum that called for autonomous governance of Crimea within Ukraine. So the next year, the Ukrainian government abrogated the Crimean constitution, abolished the post of president, and deported Meshkov to Russia at gunpoint. Uh, so Crimeans already had a bit of a grudge against the uh, Ukrainian government even before the 2014 coup. And after the coup, with Russian-hating fascists having newfound power, sentiment to leave Ukraine became overwhelming. Now, residents of the Donbass, who are also majority Russian-speaking, likewise had had enough of the coup government and its anti-Russian bigotry. So, in 2014, in an overwhelming uh, vote, 89% uh, in Donetsk, 96% in Luhansk, the people of the Donbass region backed the formation of the independent Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, secession from Ukraine. Immediately afterwards, the coup government sent troops there in an attempt to forcibly retake control of the region from what they called terrorists. And the upshot has been eight years of civil war, relentless attacks by the Ukrainian military and fascist militias on the Donbass region, often targeted at civilian areas with no military targets present and the result has been over 14,000 deaths and vast destruction. There were attempts to settle the conflict peacefully, the Minsk 1 and 2 treaties, but it's now clear that Ukraine never had any intention of honoring the Minsk agreements. And it remains intransigent about pursuing peace up until this day. In fact, not only has it continued to claim its desire to retake Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, which, along with two other Ukrainian republics, held referendums where their citizens voted overwhelmingly to join Russia a few months ago. Uh, Ukraine has also 
uh, stretching all the way back to 2014, consistently declared its desire to attack and retake Crimea. And in case you need reminding, since 2014, a dominant role has been played in Ukraine by literal Nazis who hate and want to exterminate ethnic Russians. And although they've been diminished somewhat by recent Russian military success, the missile and artillery attacks on civilian targets in the Donbass have continued up to this day. So residents of that region are not going to be safe until either the Ukrainian military is completely defeated or the Ukrainian government and its western backers decide they've had enough. <clears throat> Russia laid out its terms for peace a year ago. Recognition of Crimea as part of Russia, recognition of the eastern separatist regions as independent, although now that's going to be upped to recognizing them as part of Russia as well as the other two regions, a change in Ukraine's constitution to guarantee that it won't join NATO. Ukraine was actually on the verge of agreeing to those terms uh, that were proposed a year ago uh, in peace negotiations mediated by Turkey, but that agreement was sabotaged by the US and UK. So now it's a year later, a year of brutal war later, uh, the terms have changed somewhat as I mentioned, but even his, Henry Kissinger has recognized that in order for peace to occur, territorial concessions will have to be made by Ukraine. And there will also have to be security arrangements agreed to by all parties involved in the conflict, similar to the draft treaties put out by the Russians in December 2021, which made some very reasonable proposals for collective security in Europe. Peace is only going to be possible when the legitimate security concerns of both Russia and ethnic Russians are met, and when sincere efforts are made to pursue arms control and de-escalation in the region. And the whole world is watching and hoping for that to happen. Thanks for listening. This is Jeff Melton from The Bitter Pill.